many have to say that was moving uh, and stunning, uh, no less than what we expected, but everything we could have hoped. So thank you uh, for that remarkable uh, speech. So I've been in this place for seven weeks. For seven weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been thinking a lot about Pomona now, about who we are. But first, I have to say that Pomona now is home. It's a tall order for any of us to come to a full understanding of this beautiful place and call it home, even when, for many of us, it may still feel so very strange. Where does each of us fit into it? What called us here together? What does it mean to convene here? For seven weeks now, I've been thinking, and I want to share with you some of what I have learned. Pomona now is a place of discovery. About seven days ago, the sun almost disappeared. <laughs> Why not today? <clears throat> Many of us gathered in the courtyard at Milliken, daring to look up at what for the vast majority of human history was a sight guaranteed to blind. But with centuries of human discovery and human ingenuity, we can know the movements of the heavens, and we looked up at a devastatingly beautiful sight together. It was a moment of discovery, of rediscovery, wrapped in wonder and excitement that made Milliken hum. And then many of us looked down and saw in the hundreds of spaces between the arcs of shadow of the plane trees, an individual crescent wrought by sun and moon beneath our feet. That is the moment now. The joy of discovery, of finding the world laid out before you, and above you, and around you. Pomona now is creativity. It is the brilliance of transposing box French sweets from the richly sonorous warmth of the cello to the riotous chirp of the mandala. What did we hear? The stirring lilt of a bird on the wing, chasing the dawn. What music is this? It is ours. Pomona now is a place of sound and silence. It's the murmur of voices in Honnold Library, the raucous laughter on Marston Quad, the soft sound of equations emerging from the hands of the professor, moving across a board. It can be the soft, softly of your roommate or a neighbor. It's the sound of an embrace that renews hope. It is the sound of sage hens in a brush. Sage hens are good thing. now is also confidence. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're all nervous. We take our places here at this banquet of knowledge and life. I've sweat bullets, and not just because it's hot outside, and it's okay. You know, chin up. Each of us is in this place. We've been lucky, too, and there's so many more than those we now can gather here who, too, could take wing and fly. So let us be mindful of our duties to others, to take what we learn and spread it wide, to help the world hear our many voices. And I know Pomona now is also confusion. You know, there's the minor things, like which way is on? And did I do my assignment right? And then there are the major things, like who will judge me by my face, by my words, by the way I move, by the accent of my speech, questions of whether or not speaking freely is harmful or empowering, does it make you cower, or can we boldly rise together to meet a challenge? Can we make stronger arguments, stretch our thinking, delve deeper into ideas, and know that even in disagreement, we can still can find peace? Now, on the way to this gathering, we all saw the open space outside the doors of Little Bridges. And our question is, can our campus truly be a space of openness so all have room to breathe, to speak, and to thrive? As we acknowledge historical barriers erected upon some such seemingly open fields, such hallowed places, barriers that haven't served to enact silence and have promoted a kind of humble acquiescence to some natural order, we must pause. Because Pomona cannot ever be a place of silent acquiescence for any one of us. The question stands, how can we raise our voices and be heard and not yet raise more barriers and more walls to silence dissent? 
This is the hard work to which we all will be called. And as we do that, so we will find things to learn and things to unlearn. And that too is Pomona now. Pomona now must be a place where a swell of voices creates a sound that the world cannot ignore. It is not the sound of everyone speaking to the same vision or sharing the same views. It must always be more than that. Because Pomona now is constantly changing. 450 new voices arrived just since the spring. And as they come, they change us. We will change. Let us do it wisely. Because Pomona now is people. It's the young man who wrote lovingly at particle accelerators in his letter to his new advisor. It's the student who struck off across country as a posse fellow. It's an athlete furiously focused on the field. It's a student with an idea, with a dream, on a quest. It's a woman fiercely reeling across the campus as she follows her heart and mind. It's a poet with a line she just can't get right. It's a botanist seeking knowledge in the folds of DNA. It's the ground staff whose hands plant the trees that make each of our breaths smell sweeter. It's the dining staff who pour care and knowledge into the food that sustains us. It's the faculty who strike out new paths, seeking challenge around the world inside an atom, on a dance floor, on a canvas, in a book. It is all of us. Sometimes we get to a point now in this powerful, complex, painful, and inspiring history that is Pomona now. For some of us want to say, just let it be. But let it be I'm talking about this resigned and wise, let it be, live and let live, let's go on. But that's always in tension with who we might want to be and who we are, who we may become. Let be or let it be can also be in tension with who we seem to be. But that can't get in the way of our growing together, learning from each other, knowing each other. So that's my challenge to you. Put let be in dialogue with what might be and what we might seem to be so that Pomona now becomes a Pomona better. So let's think for a moment about what we might seem to be. People around you, they seem to be so very many things. But that scene is what you see in them, not who they are. It's New Year. None of us knows who the other really is. We know ourselves how we might be, who we might be, and who we might seem to be. But sooner or later, what seems must be what is, and what we make together. I have this habit of going to poetry when I want to think about something. This poetry comes from the Greek word poesis, which means making, okay? And when I'm talking about making something, poetry seems a great model for that. So I plan to end with the ending of a favorite poem um, called The Emperor of Ice Cream. Um, it. It's by a great American poet who's also an insurance salesman. And he was a complicated person whom I don't think I would actually have liked. And I don't think he would actually have liked me. If you read more of his words, you'll understand what I mean. But I know I love his words. It's Wallace Stevens. It's a poem about a child who is waiting for a funeral. And the kid can't quite understand what is happening. All they want is what they know what they're used to. And then a room nearby, there's a man who is whipping ice cream in a cup. Um, concupiscent curds is how he describes it. Well, there's an old woman who lies still on a table ready for burial. And the last lines say, let be, be finale of scene. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. What he means is, nothing rules us unless we let it, and nothing blinds us except our own sight. Have done with what seems to be and search for what actually is. But as I wrote, I found another voice in my ears and another poem in my hands. It was a gift from my husband, who's here today, um, sitting next to my mom. Thank you both for coming um, all the way across the country, as well as here. Um, and it was a program from a reading that Elizabeth Bishop, who's my favorite poem in all the world, did at the Wallace Stevens Society in Hartford, Connecticut on Tuesday, April 11, 1978. And she marked it up in her own hand, um, which is really cool. Um, and 
She read a handful of poems, which she put in dialogue with the works of Stevens. One was by a shy poet whom she identified as, quote, wiry with red bushy hair, who was no fan of Stevens. Another was by a woman about how hard women's lives can be, and it was a poem provokingly and even comically titled, The Trojan Fetus. Another was about waiting in the midst of war for the sirens and trying not to hear. But the very first poem that she read was one of her own, and it will be the last that I read here today, for it speaks to me deeply of Pomona now, of the alarming, exhilarating, magical move we all take in one form or another to make this place home. It's called Hieronymus House. My house, my fairy palace, is of perishable clabbers with three rooms and all. My gray wasp's nest of chewed up paper glued with spit. It is endowed with a veranda of wooden lakes adorned with ferns planted in sponges in the front room with red and green leftover Christmas decorations looped from the corners to the middle above my little center table of woven wicker painted blue. And four blue chairs and an affair for the smallest baby with a tray with ten big beads. Then on the walls, two palm leaf fans and a calendar. And at night, you'd think my house abandoned. Come closer. We can see and hear the writing paper, lines of light, and the voices of my radio singing flamingos in between the lottery numbers. When I move, I take these things, not much more, from my shelter. Let us together make Pomona now our shelter, our home, our field, our worlds. Let us make our words count. Let us open wide our fields and minds so that Pomona now will be stronger, better, and wiser together.